Welcome to a new lecture in the course Optimization Methods for Machine Learning and Engineering. Today we will talk about classification support vector machines and the reproducing kernel Hilbert space. And uh, the lecture is structured as follows. First of all, we will see linear classification and then we make the extension to nonlinear classification. And uh, we will see how, how kernels are helping us in uh, having efficient nonlinear classification. And then we will see some of the theoretical background that is very important today in machine learning, the reproducing kernel Hilbert space. Let's jump right into the subject, classification. Um, there's a lot of history with respect to classification and many scientific disciplines have created taxonomies to somehow structure their field. This has started really early, already Aristotle, the Greek philosopher has uh, developed a taxonomy for the entire world where he first classified everything into the living things and the non-living things and then the living things were classified into animals and plants and then the animals were classified into the humans and the other animals and so on and he created a taxonomy that encompassed the whole world and uh, from today's perspective we would say this was also a MISI taxonomy. So MISI is an abbreviation. It stands for mutually exclusive but completely exhaustive. And that defines that the taxonomy encompasses the entire domain and all the sub-definitions that were created, um, they span the entire domain. So there is nothing left out and all the categories are disjoint. And this is nice and this is a property that you also want to have in, uh, for example, when, when you prepare a talk that uh, you want to have disjoint categories of elements that you talk about and these MIFI category or MISI uh, properties are, are something you can think about in, in many also non-scientific applications. Okay, but uh, this classification of the world and the classification of uh, botany and the animals uh, it, it was continued and today's system it essentially stems from Carl von Linne who defined a five level hierarchy to classify all plants and animals. Today we have a couple more levels but uh, essentially what he defined is still in use and uh, what is also still in use is the binomial naming scheme for giving Latin names to um, well, uh, uh, species. And um, the, the species is uh, denoted by a genus which, which is a larger uh, class of, or class has a specific meaning, but it's a, it's, a, um, it's a certain group of animals that somehow belong together that are in the genus. And then the, the species is, is added and uh, then makes the precise definition. Here it's boa constrictor, boa is the genus, constrictor is the species. And then we can go up the chain. Uh, so it belongs to the family of boidae and uh, the order are the squamata, so the, the serpents, uh, the class of the reptilia and so on, and we go up the chain until we end up basically with, with animals or living things that have a, a cell nucleus. Okay. And um, well, it's good to have um, a classification with uh, such uh, many levels because there are an estimated eight to eight, seven uh, million species on Earth. Many of them we don't know about, we haven't classified, we haven't given a name to them. Um, um, but the, so it's good to have this hierarchy, uh, so there is no like overcrowding. And, um, but we also have to see that uh, how the levels are defined, this is somewhat arbitrary. Uh, obviously there are good reasons why they were uh, defined the way they are, but uh, to some extent nature and evolution doesn't consider that now it might be the right time to create a new genus. Um, this is something, uh, this is an emerging property and there are also areas where, where the levels you see here are not as clear cut as, as uh, people might want to make you believe. Okay, now Today, uh, classification is the name of the game, but uh, we want to do this automatically and uh, with uh, machine learning. So we want to take a look at data and based on the data, uh, classify. Um, the example we have here is one for binary classification, where I have uh, elements of just two different categories or, or classes. And uh, here we consider to have only two classes, uh, plus one and minus one. 
And well, obviously we can map to that, uh, even if our categories are red and green, I could still map them to plus one and minus one. And uh, this has some advantages in, in the mathematics that we will develop to have these class labels. So all the data that we consider, uh, it is uh, the training data is in a big set D and it contains tuples of the features of the objects that have been observed and the ground truth class label. So here the feature vector is um, x or xi with x i with i between uh, 1 and, and small d. So small d is the size of our training data set. And here we always have the, the feature vector uh, x and uh, then the ground truth label L. And um, in this first part of the lecture, we are using so-called linear classification, which is well quite simple type of classification. Uh, we just uh, multiply all the features in the feature vector with a weight w and add some intercept or offset on top. And um, then the question is whether for this formula, um, um, which has which has to be zero exactly on the classification boundary. And if for this formula, we end up with a positive number for our particular xi, then we classify the whole thing as um, plus one. And if we end up on the negative side, then it is minus one. So um, in the classification, we are not so much concerned with the actual numerical value that comes out of the term uh, w transposed x plus b, but uh, only the sign whether we end up on the positive or on the negative side of that. Okay, and in the picture on the right hand side, where well, we have the orange class, it's plus one, the negative class, it's minus one, and here the, the boundary in the middle. So in this particular case, the boundary it crosses like the zero position if we imagine the zero would be there, um, but uh, since we can also have an offset. The linear classification could also lie somehow like this in uh, our space. Okay. And in overall, we have a very simple test to see whether a classification was done correctly. Um, we can take our element xi, plug it into the evaluation term, and multiply the entire thing by the ground truth label. Uh, the ground truth label, which is plus one or minus one. And um, depending on, um, well, now consider the case that the ground truth is plus one. So uh, we want to have um, the, the term here in brackets. So this evaluation term, we want to have it also positive so that the entire thing is larger than zero. If however, we want the, uh, the ground truth label is minus one, then we want the uh, evaluation term also to be negative so that the entire thing is larger than zero. And therefore this is a very easy test to check whether um, well, our, um, our uh, predicted label lies on the correct side of the boundary. Yeah? And so here, uh, this, uh, this uh, sign operator here, uh, we consider this to only return either minus one or plus one, um, well, depending on, on uh, which side the, the, the term uh, ends up. Okay, now we now see a first algorithm that can do the training of a linear classifier. So we give this algorithm our training data, it will turn the crank and come up exactly with a, a weights vector w and an offset v uh, for us to be used in a, a linear classifier. Now, so the, the procedure down here, this is actually the general linear classifier. And uh, uh, on top, we have a special training routine, which is the perceptron. The perceptron is a type of neural network. We encountered that already in a previous lecture, but a, a single layer perceptron, actually it's just a linear classifier. And uh, what happens here is that um, um, we randomly select our training samples that are misclassified and then adjust the weights or the, the parameters of our linear classifier uh, to, to, to make an improvement. So initially we, we set the weights to zero and also the, the, the weights vector we set to zero. The weights vector and B we set to zero and then we loop over um, uh, a big while loop 
And this while loop, it only ends as soon as all our samples have been correctly classified. And uh, so this is a shorthand here, uh, gamma d, and uh, it contains the indices of all the samples that were misclassified that are not in accordance to the to this uh, to this uh, little check uh, that we saw on on the previous slide. Okay, and as long as we have misclassified samples. We will randomly select one of them and then use the feature vector from this sample and uh, also the, the, the ground truth label to nudge our weights into the correct direction. So um, if then our training samples are linearly separable, we know that this procedure will uh, converge in a finite number of steps and uh, give us um, the uh, weight vector W and offset B uh, to perfectly classify the training samples. If our training samples are not linearly separable, so if I cannot find a linear decision boundary to, to separate the two perfectly, then this training algorithm, it will loop infinite, indefinitely and I need to have some other argument to, to, to break out of the loop and say, well, maybe I cannot improve further about it. Um, what is important furthermore is that um, the, the weights uh, or the, the model parameters are invariant to scalar multiplication. So um, what does that mean? Imagine that I have a, a, a c larger than zero, so some scalar, and I'm multiplying both the w and the offset with c, so s is done here. Then I can just pull that out and we will see that the, um, the, the, the end result, meaning the sign of the overall term, will not change by having a positive scalar multiplied on front. Yeah? So therefore, the W and the B are invariant to, um, to, to, to this scaling. And um, that is good for us because uh, imagine that we have to do uh, millions and millions of iterations of this perceptron training uh, that means we might run into numerical issues when the W becomes very large, uh, but by having this uh, invariance to scalar multiplication, we can just find C in such a way that we normalize W to, to a certain length, and uh, this then avoids uh, running into, into these numerical issues. Okay. Now let's apply the perceptron on an example dataset, and here we are using a very famous dataset, uh, which is the Iris dataset by uh, Ronald Fischer. He originally used that in uh, his 1936 paper. He was one of the first ever to use uh, linear classification or to, to think about this in, in, in formal terms, and uh, the Iris dataset was used then and is still today uh, one of the, the classical benchmark datasets in use. So here we have uh, several species of, of iris, and uh, they differ in the size of the flower petal, so the length and the width. And uh, we can put that into two uh, dimensions for, for the features. And uh, here you see that for two particular species of iris, um, we can find a linear classifier that, that separates the two, the two classes. Um, the perceptron therefore converges and the perceptron gives us um, a, a classifier that does his job perfectly. However, the, every time we run the perceptron algorithm, we will get a different result. And uh, so here you see the two, the two red lines on the left-hand figure. And uh, the, difference, the differences can be quite dramatic. And um, so there is no way to tell the perceptron to maybe even further improve the result he has found here, because as soon as all the samples are correctly classified, the perceptron will just stop. Okay, so every time we run the perceptron algorithm, we have slightly different results, and uh, maybe the results are not very robust. So because uh, all the, the flower instances we encounter are uh, randomized somehow, and therefore, um, it is likely that eventually we run into, into Setosa or Virginica iris that end up here on, on the wrong side of the classification that we found. What we would prefer here is to say, well, uh, why don't we put the classification um, boundary, the decision boundary, right in the middle, 
and uh, therefore we are more robust to, to these uh, random perturbations. And um, this idea is uh, at the very core of the so-called support vector machine. So the support vector machine was developed in the early 90s and uh, you see here uh, Bosa is the first author of the paper. But actually the genius, and I think it's the last author of the paper, is, is, is Vladimir Vatnik, who uh, well, developed uh, the main body of the, of the theory of learning theory and also uh, support vector machines specifically. So what does the support vector machine do? Uh, we explicitly consider the distance between the decision boundary and the first training example that is closest to the decision boundary. Or could be also several of them. Huh? So in this particular case, here we see that we have several of the samples that have more or less the same distance to the decision boundary. Okay. And uh, the nice advantage of this is now that um, we are robust and the S4M doesn't depend on some random algorithm, but training the SVM is actually solving a convex optimization problem. And um, we know that um, we have achieved the perfect result uh, independently of the ordering of the training samples or, or similarly. Uh, what we look at here is the so-called hard margin SVM. Uh, which means that we don't allow outliers to be on the wrong side of the border. Uh, there is also a version called soft margin SVM where we allow misclassified outliers in, and we make a trade-off to allow maybe a simpler classification boundary um, um, in exchange for a couple of uh, misclassified examples. Um, but here, for just for the exposition, we only consider the, the hard margin SVM. Okay, and uh, the formula that you see here on the left-hand side, uh, it is still incomplete. So it refers to the distance between the, um, the uh, classification boundary and the sample's rho, but it doesn't make explicit um, where, how the rho and how the training samples and under weights w, how they interrelate. So this is still an incomplete formula and we will now um, develop this a little further and, and, and in the end have uh, actually an optimization problem that uh, we can put into the algorithms that were developed in the, in the previous lectures. Okay, now consider that we have exactly one sample that is closest to the decision boundary. Yeah? So that doesn't have to be unique, but uh, for now consider we have exactly one that is closest to the decision boundary. And um, then, uh, so let's say the decision boundary is somewhere here and our closest sample is here. And uh, so then we have a distance between the decision boundary and our sample. You might also recall the projection theorem that we heard about in the context of vector spaces. So all of this applies here. Um, and uh, now we have some um, position H on the decision boundary, that uh, is the point that cl is closest to our x or x plus. And uh, actually we uh, want to, to minimize um, or we can describe the distance here between our h and our x plus. Uh, and here, so here we have our distance rho here in between. Okay. Now, um, we note that our vector dw, uh, so um, we have uh, our decision boundary is defined as uh, w transposed x plus b equals to zero. And uh, we note that bw, bw, w, um, is actually uh, orthogonal to the decision boundary. So if we take our uh, w and put it somewhere here on this line. So we transpose it and put it somewhere here on this line. Then our w vector would actually be orthogonal. And, um, um, and um, uh, we can now use this property. Um, and uh, so what we do is, first of all, we say that w divided by w um, the, the Euclidean norm, so here we are still in Euclidean space. Um, this guy here, 
this is a vector that is orthogonal to the uh, decision boundary and it has the length 1. And uh, therefore, when we um, multiply this uh, vector of length 1 by rho, then this exactly brings us from h to our x plus. Yeah? And this is why this formula here holds true and we, we are starting with that. And now we develop this a little further. Uh, we multiply both sides with w and expand a little bit. Um, and uh, then we add b as well to both sides. And then we will find out that uh, we have wh plus b um, um, on the right hand side. And this is exactly zero because we know that h lies on the decision boundary. In addition, um, for the left hand side, we have um, w transposed x plus b. And now, because of the invariance to scaling, we can now scale the left hand side so that the left hand side has a norm of exactly one. Um, or not the norm, but, but uh, a length of exactly one. Yeah. So here, this guy here, just by definition, just by using the freedom of having a scaling to the uh, w, um, we can define, by definition, define the left-hand side to be exactly 1. And this gives us our end result, rho equals 1 over the Euclidean norm of w. And um, that's great, because now we can just plug it in and uh, have uh, some optimization problem that can be solved, 1 over the norm of w subject to a couple of constraints. And um, so here in the constraints, we encounter once more the fact that we wanted the uh, w transposed x plus plus b equal to 1. So here we have this guy. Yeah, and I'm adding a mark. And this guy is exactly plugged in here. Um, or this is the, the same, but represented in the optimization problem, um, because we know that x plus is closest to um, the decision boundary, and therefore uh, this just says that for the element uh, that is closest to the decision boundary, we want um, we want the uh, the result of the classification term to be exactly one there. Okay. Now, on the left-hand side, we still have a maximization term. Um, we would prefer a canonical minimization. Uh, so, therefore, we um, rewrite this a little bit and uh, we can just replace uh, 1 over w, uh, the Euclidean norm of w, by just the Euclidean norm of w um, to transform it into a minimization problem that would be equivalent so that it has the same optimizer. And then we can also just square it, and then we end up with something that is mathematically nicer. We are adding here again a scaling factor. We end up with one and a half um, the squared norm of, of w. And uh, this is the optimization problem that we need for um, 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 optimizing the or finding the, the, the best linear classifier in terms of the SVM. Yeah, so then when we go back here to our uh, Iris plans, uh, we just run this uh, convex optimization problem and uh, we find a classification boundary that is exactly in the middle between the two categories and uh, that has maximum distance from each category to the boundary.